Oh, hello, good evening, folks. Welcome to another fine edition of the Land Tamper Stream, where we do CCIE study and we rack our brains and we work on networking and we aspire and dream to be big in the networking world. So, uh, thanks for joining us if you're here. I uh, appreciate it. And let's talk a little bit about the CCI journey that we're on and how we're doing. Got some interesting protocol stuff to talk about today. Uh, Hey, dude for him is here. Dude for him and I have been in a long chain of discussion about RIP of all things that I'm going to get into in a minute. We may lab it up here on stream, uh, dude for him. See if I can uh, replicate what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, um, howdy, Mark Milo. Good to have you again in the chat. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this, by the way, wallpaper of the day. This is, uh, I'm, I've been kind of you know, riding high on some of these great shots that came out of this uh, Monday morning launch out in uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, the latest SpaceX flight. It was for a Spanish satellite or something of that nature. But anyway, it's pretty cool. This is, of course, the first time they landed, um, returned the Stage 1 rocket to land back on land on the West Coast. Really cool shot. But yeah, those are on Flickr.com slash SpaceX. So yeah, vlogging. How have I been doing? I've been making some actually good progress, finally. I'm not distracted by LinkedIn, anything else. So I had a little time at lunch uh, to play around. So I got, and last night, of course, had a little time to finish up a lesson. So do good. I, I'm primarily working with NetworkLessons.com on PIM Dense Mode. I did skip around a little bit, though, because... Uh, Duke for him and I started this thing where we're going to help each other get ready for the written. We're kind of partnering up and we're asking each other a question a day. So as soon as I opened Twitter this morning, bam, I had a message from Dude for him. Appreciate that, Dude for him. And uh, it's about RIP. And I hesitated on the answer because I actually think, and I'm just going to say, you know, I think it's important to know RIP summarization for the CCI written. It is in the blueprint. And um, I'm not going to sit here and say that I've taken two written exams and not been uh, quizzed on RIP. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> so this is good. And in particular, summarization can be their finer points in how summarization actually works, the mechanics of what happens. And he gave me a good question about this today. And I did not have confidently the answer. Um, so we came up with sort of a disparity, and let's go into a little bit of detail here. I'm going to open just a sort of picture. Just as much as learning PPPoE is of utmost importance, have to love their blueprints. Yes, PPPoE. The good thing about RIP, though, I don't mind tanking some time into RIP because it's very likely you're going to see RIP in the lab exam as well. PPPoE, you could, well, I don't know, this revision... At Cisco Live, I did a walk-in self-paced lab where they give you like a uh, a piece of the real lab. They give you a piece of the diag. They give you a piece of, you know, they let you experience it. They give you a piece of the config lab. They give you a piece of the troubleshooting lab. So I know kind of what to expect, not emotionally or mentally, but I know what to expect in terms of format. And, you know, there was a PPPoE, and again, these are not, obviously they do it at Cisco Live. This is stuff that's either older or, you know, they're not including it anymore. But it had a PPPoE. In fact, it had a PPPoE client, and it had a PPPoE uh, dialer server set up. And I totally failed that part of the sort of little test um, exam, and I think that was the, yeah, that was a troubleshooting component. That was actually part of the troubleshooting exam. I could not get it right. Um, but anyway, yeah, PPP, uh, you know, it's still good to know it, right? And you need to know it. I don't, I don't think that's in the scope of the lab exam, but it's definitely in the scope of the written exam. I mean, that was not very logical like other protocols, yeah. I mean, I understand PPPOE, like the history of it, how it came about, and how widely it is in use. It's actually used a lot. I mean, um, 
Both PPP and PPPoE are very commonly used uh, for residential internet, right? Um, so yeah, I can really understand it for the service provider, like that you would need to know it, probably be able to do it in the lab exam for the service provider. I don't know if it's in there, um, but yeah, I'm glad I know a little bit about it for the written. I did learn a lot actually studying it, the uh, PPPO. But let's talk a little bit about RIP here. And I'm not going to pull up the whole exchange, but I'm actually going to show. Here's the conundrum we have. And I'm going to go ahead. Uh, let's lab it. Why not? So on our little Twitter chain here, uh, Twitter DMs. All right, so, so here's a conundrum. And, and I'll just pull up the, I'll show it in the lab because the lab has a diagram there in and of itself, right, in the HTML5 console. But it has to do with when you have summarization turned on. So I had not really heard, uh, heard of this, but essentially the idea is that with, and we're talking about RIP v2, Hope to God that we don't see RIP v1. Uh, RIP v2 summarization. So the question comes up is if you have um, interface GI0, zero, zero, right? And router one, and the interface GI0, zero, one, And then you have interface GI01, router two. So this is what I have observed is that, um, well, I'll wait. I'll wait for the lab to come up because it's gonna be hard to explain with ASCII, ASCII characters, okay? Um, but let's pull this up real quick. Yep, still. Oh, I haven't started the VM. My bad. Yeah, but it has to do with. Uh, supposedly, there is a. Uh, this is what Dufram was quizzing me about. Supposedly, there is a sort of exception made for a particular subnet that is 10. 10.0.0.0. Obviously, that it's RFC 1918 space. And it's used. Qu you know, frequently in enterprise environments, right? In enterprise networks. Well, theoretically, there is a, an exception to summarization of networks uh, or subnets that are part of the 10.0.0 class A network. And it is such that if you are advertising uh, rip routes to a neighbor, that you'll summarize pretty much any other, you'll auto-summarize any other network. 11, for example. Let's say you have an interface, 11, 11, 11, 11. That you're going to summarize that class A to the class A boundary. And you're going to advertise 11.0.0.0 slash 8 to a RIP neighbor. But that if you have an, uh, the interface that's in the 10.10.10. .10 .10 uh, zero slash 24 network that when you advertise that to router two that you're not going to advertise the um, the class A network you're going to advertise the subnets as well actually it's any network okay maybe I was confused on that hey mentors good to see you it's fine, we'll forgive you this time and tardy today, but I am gonna have to mark you down as tardy today, mentors, just so you know. But that's your only tardy so far this school year, so. Uh, Big Abe, now, that's okay, you know, we'll mark you, we'll mark you tardy. Um, if it was a Friday, you know, I'd let you go. We wouldn't even uh, be talking about it, but. <laughs> Okay, as long as the interface going to the other router is in the same network, it sends subnets. Okay, okay, yes. I, I definitely go along with that for sure, do for him. 
but I don't think it's going to ever. Yeah. So that means that if you advertise to another network, uh, let's say router two now advertises to router three. I don't think he's going to advertise those subnets, right? Are we in agreement on that or? Then it sends classful. Yes. Okay, good. So we were essentially, I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I misread what you said, I think, in the tweet. So, so good. We'll, we'll just bring up the lab and I'll show folks what we're talking about. It's good to it's good to talk about it though, definitely, dude, because that could be so confusing when you're looking at it on that router, right? Uh, but let's clear that up for everyone. And when you first asked me, I did not mention that uh, exception, so I'm glad you um, brought that up. That was a very man for the first day. This is awesome. I mean, you should you guys should see this like chain. Of Twitter, we got screenshots, we got lab, we were like labbing it up. We're like, oh man, I don't know about that, you know. Uh, great kind of dialogue, which is perfect. That's exactly what is going to get you deep into the protocols. So let's do admin Eve. I did this wrong, but that's okay. I'm just going to go with it. Uh, I'm going to run with it. This is the this is the console mode. You do not get. Uh, you only get in Pro, which is the like sandbox. So I, I'm basically the HTML5 desktop. I think that's, I'm saying the right one, right? Yeah, normally I use the HTML5 console, but I happen to log into the desktop, which is great if you are in like an environment where you're very locked down. This is a good way where you could actually still kind of run your lab. Uh, so let's open the RIP lab. Actually, do I have any? Oh, I had a running lab. I don't anymore. Okay. Yeah, this is it. Uh, I'm not used to this interface here. Open. This is basically a Docker container running Firefox. It's pretty responsive. I like it. It's actually a little more responsive than the HTML5 console, I think. So here's, here's what we're talking about, folks. Um, let's say I am router three. Can you tell me, and, and let's say this entire network, let, let's see if anyone here can tell us. So we have these five routers. We have four network segments. All routers are running RIP version 2. And they're running auto summarization. Okay. So let's just ask you... Um, There, there is actually one thing I'm not sure how you got working, Duke, for him. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I do. I, I do actually think I know, know that. Okay. All right, so let's say we have router 3. So this is router 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is router 3. Summarization's turned on. Think about what networks I'm going to do. I'm going to see if I do a show... IP route, okay. Uh oh, did the stream stop? Oh shoot, sorry guys.
Okay, let's check out our stream health. Alright, it says I'm still live. Can you all see me now? Yeah, it says my stream health is excellent. So, what, how are we doing, chat? Are we... Are we in there? This is uh, my total data output bit rate. Let's reset that. Yeah, I think my VM caused a problem. It says I'm live and I'm recording. No drop frames. How are we doing, folks? We good? Okay, it is back. Good deal. All right, sorry about that. Not sure what that was. Um, let me F5. <laughs> yep, I had to press play button. Okay, weird. Yeah, I wonder if that was a Twitch thing then. Because the whole time it showed me that I was um, uh, live on Twitch. So, yeah, I wonder if that's a, a some sort of Twitch issue. All right, good deal. Well, anyway, my point was, and I may lab this later and just share the results, just in case it was my lab that crashed the stream. Um, oh, it did show us live, just no video. Interesting. Yeah. All right, sorry about that, folks. So, basically, if you have, so let's say summarization is turned on. And you have an, uh, router 1 and router 2. Actually, I'm going to pull up a photo here, if you don't mind. Dude, for, I'll pull up the screenshot you showed me. Yes, this one. Okay. Good call. Good call out. So, all right. So, as we see here, we have two routers, router 4 and router 5, with a uh, single connected interface between them. Um... You'll notice something is interesting here. There's a lot of, there's, there's a little bit going on, right? We've got a few interfaces. I don't know if those other, other interfaces are loopbacks, um, but we've got several directly connect, yeah, loopbacks. So we've got a few loopbacks here. Yep, all loopbacks. So we've got 10, 11, 1, 1, 1, 0. Uh, we've got 10, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 10, 2, 2, 2, 0, 10, 12, 12, 12, 0. And What's happening here, right? Uh, I'm going to screenshot so this so we can see better. Because with preview, I can zoom way in if we need to. Yeah. Zoom way in. Okay, so here's the thing. To me, what this looks like is, well, all right, we've got all these loopbacks over here, but our interface going to router 5 is on the 10 network. Yeah, thanks, Jax. Eyes are bad. <laughs> What'd you say, Shunny? Can we see it now? <laughs> hey, I'm getting like that, man. <laughs> um, so what we see here is basically, basically, you could have all these networks over here, and some of them are on 10, some of them are not. But if I'm advertising networks to, uh, if I have an interface inside of 10, the class A 10 000 slash 8, then basically this router is going to break the rules of summarization, right? Both routers are. Because, um, it looks like it, there's an exception to the summarization rule if I have a stinking interface in that class A. In this case, it's class A, right, uh, for the 10 network. So look what it's done, right? So we took two. 
Like this has uh, got a two down. That's a slash eight, so that really doesn't help us a whole lot. Uh, but over here, for example, we've got 11110 slash 24 is connected. When we redistribute it or advertise it into RIP, notice here that it comes over as a slash eight, right? Well, why does 10 get special treatment? Because I've got a 10, 1, 2, 0. I've got a 10, 12, 12, 0. We look over here, it's because, of course, Router 5 has an interface in the 10 network. And DudeFrame has kindly placed a small little yellow arrow here to <laughs> bring it to my attention, right? This fast interface is in Class A Network 10. So we're gonna break all the rules there, and this rip route got advertised as um, 10.1.2. Uh, you know what's interesting here, though? And this is what's interesting, uh, dude. For him, did you notice this? Um, notice what it says is subnetted. It says 10.0.0/24 is subnetted. Right, 10, 12, 12, 0 is a link. So, um, router 5, his link to his neighbor, um, it's almost like he has to break the rules to even be able to participate in RIP summarization. Yeah, exactly. You are subnetting. It really should say technically... If 10.0.0 slash 24 is subnetted, it would be 10.0.0.128 slash uh, 25, right? That is a true subnet of 10.0.0.0. Uh, 10.1.2.0 technically is not a, a subnet of 10.0.0.0 slash 24, right? But it's almost like it's kind of breaking the rules here or making an exception. When really this should say 10.0.0.0 slash 24, the class A that my interface is plugged into is subnetted. And here are the routes then that I'm going to learn about. 10.1.2.0, um, 10.12.12.0, which is directly connected. 10.2.2.0 is directly connected. Um... But yes, I'm learning about 10.1.2.0. And I can understand why that might be needed. For example, um, let's say that um, you wanted this interface to participate in RIP, 10.12.12.0. But let's say you had a filter, an outbound filter on 10, on the 10 network. I don't know. I guess I could see how you would still want to see that there is another rip route upstream that I would need to um, send to another neighbor, even though, or, or let's say this, let's say I had two neighbors and I was filtering outbound to one of them, my 10 interface, 10, 12, 12. But I'm not filtering to the other. I don't know. That that really doesn't work either. But I guess it's still important to know that there's an upstream route to a 10 network. Even though I'm in the 10 network, right? Because it's kind of redundant. So if I'm going to advertise, let's say R5 has eight routers out here. And I want to run, run RIP. Um, it's kind of redundant for me to say, um, and none of them are in the 10 network. These are 172.16, 172.17, 172.18, 172.19, right? I'm going to advertise to those neighbors a 10.0.0.0 slash 8, right? I am going to summarize to them because um, they don't have a, an interface in the 10 network. But I guess it's good to know, uh, let's say due to a timer, let's say there was a flap 
No, that would still wouldn't apply. I'm trying to think why we'd still need to know have a, a rip route here because we're in the TIN network. Oh, for forwarding. Okay, that makes sense. So if I need to forward a packet to 10.1.2, I'll know I need to forward it on this interface. That's why I still need it, right? That's the use case, I guess. That's why you still need that. I have an interface in the 10 network, but if I need to reach 10.1.2.2, for example, or 2.4, I need to have a better route in my routing table. Otherwise, I'm going to drop that frame. That's why you need it, I think. I still want to use, you know, I still want to use auto summarization, but I still want to be able to forward traffic to that 10 network interface on the other side of that link. So that does make sense when you think about it that way. I'm just trying to make sense of it, you know. Sometimes I see these things, I'm like, why? <laughs> um, why it says 10 zero, zero slash... 24 instead of slash 8. I don't know because technically that is not correct. Um, but it's RIP v2, right? So duct tape, bill, and wire. Whew, that was an interesting discussion. Man, that was great, dude, for him. You know what? Um, that's why I love doing this. And I hope my question, I asked him about IGMP versions 2 and 3. Tomorrow I got to think of my next question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> uh, but that was an excellent one if that's any indication of how this partnership is going to work going forward man we are going to be ready for that written um, trivia so let's launch a little trivia here this is kind of like what he and I are doing um, but I'm going to focus on I'm going to move it to the screen over here and I did not have this planned in advance because I've been man I've been busy today Uh, let's find one here. And it's not really fair. I'm not really reviewing it for myself because I'm looking at it. I could look at just the fill-in sheet. Let's do that. We'll look at the fill-in sheet and then pick, pick one of these that's uh, not too crazy. Uh, there's OpenStack here. I'm not going to ask OpenStack because I don't see that. I could be lying, but I did not see that in the 1.1 Evolving Technologies. Uh, let's find one here real quick. Okay. What is the watch dog? system monitor look like from the CLI. All right, do we know the answer to that question? What does a watchdog system monitor look like from the CLI? Now we're talking about, um, you know, I, I can never, like, I have to look. I can't really type out the name, but... Um, yeah, these are events that you can call with uh, EEM. So if you're building an EEM script and you want to know when, for example, does a processor utilization go above 95%, right? Maybe you want to uh, shut down an interface if that happens. Like you've got an interface that is known to be very bursty and it's not... Um, it's like connected to a, a host with virtual machines on it that are for labbing or whatever. And if you, you want to trigger an event that if we see the utilization go above a certain percent, um, that we're going to shut down the interface, right? Um, this, that actually would not apply here because let's say you want to see the, that the processor that this old switch notoriously when this interface is acting up and it starts to, um, let's say it starts to go up and down, uh, starts to flap, the processor utilization goes way up 
is a clear sign. Uh, what you can do is create an EEM that when the processor hits 90%, they're going to shut down that interface. That's a better example. That's the watchdog system monitor, and it's a process that runs. So sometimes you can see if you do show proc CPU, right? But the name of the process that you would see is iOS WD Sysmon. And this is for monitoring a processor and memory usage. And what you can do, there is a um, this is the command. This is the really tricky part right here. This always gets me. So this command, uh, so we're this this watchdog daemon monitors memory and processor. So if you were to create an event like this, which one is this monitoring? Which one is it? Is it processor or memory? There are two of these event calls that you can do. And I'll bet you get it when I type the other one. Event iOS WD Sysmon X could be just a number, right? Uh, CPU proc. That helps make it, uh, when you see this, it's like I've got processor and I've got memory. Well, I don't know, which one? Uh, just know that both of these events have proc in their name. So this one is memory. And this one is CPU or the processor. Don't let this proc throw you off. That's what threw me off. So, for example, I'm going to pull up an example of this. I'm just going to Google it. Uh, Cisco. EEM, a better event manager. Oh, these, these are just the commands. Yeah. Yeah, CPU proc and mem proc. Specifies use of sample collection of CPU, CPU statistics. Specifies use of a sample collection of memory statistics. So that is important to know, right? Yeah, event iOS WD sysmon sub one mem proc. I, I think I said wrong about the show proc CPU. I don't think this is associated with a particular. It seems like I've seen it, but I could be wrong. I definitely know it's a part of e EEM. So, uh, yeah, memproc. So this is with memory. Even though it says proc, this is with memory. So that can be kind of tricky. Um, anyway, that's my little trivia for the day. Uh, don't have any really any meat chunks. Uh, there is one other thing I wanted to show or talk about on stream related to... Um, Azure that I found interesting. It has to do with PaaS services and how those work in terms of IP addressing. So many of you, if you've ever deployed a virtual machine in the cloud, uh, you know that generally uh, they will give you an option to assign a public IP to that virtual machine. Which when I first saw that, I was like, oh wow, that's cool. So I can spin up any virtual machine and get a public IP for address assigned. That's cool. On the fly, they're going to issue me a static IP, and I get it for as long as I want to use it. Well, yeah, Microsoft has like a slash 12 or something like that, or slash 10. <laughs> they, in terms of IPv4 addresses, they have a lot of them, more than most people. So, yeah, in Azure, also in Google Cloud, you know, in Amazon, I'm sure it's the same. Yeah, sure, just any virtual machine. Say, so give me a public IP, IPv4, boom, you got it. Um, well, there are, of course, policies that you can set in Azure, a lot like group policy on-premise, right, where you can say, all right, only these particular users or this group of users is allowed to um, 
obviously in, in an enterprise environment or a, a small business or government, uh, you don't want to allow just anyone to be able to issue a public IP um, on a virtual machine in Azure. You want people, you want to, um, you want to enable people to, to allow them to sandbox or build things in their environment, do testing, do de development. And you don't want to have to create the virtual machines for everybody, but you want to be able to put guardrails in place, right? And it's not hard to do in Azure to put those kind of restrictions in place, but you have to treat paths a little differently. We're talking about IaaS, right? Infrastructure as a service. We're talking about traditional virtual machines, virtual networks, storage. Uh, when you get into PaaS offerings, platform as a service, for example, Azure, you have Azure SQL database. And that is an instance that you can uh, provision in Azure uh, where, you know, it's not just servers. Uh, it's something that, um, it's not, you know, a virtual machine necessarily, just running SQL. It's a platform as a service offering. It's something that Microsoft runs. And I was curious to see what that looked like in terms of IP addresses. Um, if you want to do PaaS, of course, generally those by default are going to be accessible via the internet. Think of Office 365, right? Uh, yes, you can route traffic. Now, you can route traffic for Office 365 over an MPLS circuit, for example. And you're going to get public IP prefixes uh, sent to you. And you can route that way. But generally, when you provision a service like Office 365, that's going to be a URL. They're going to give you a host name in order to access your services, right? Or uh, Azure SQL, right? Uh, they're going to give you a URL, and that's how you get to it. I, I was just interested to see today what those URLs look like, so I did one. I actually provisioned Azure SQL on, like, a test account. And let me see if I can find it. I have a screenshot here. I could have sworn that I sent it in a memento. Man, I don't think I do. Let me see real quick. Terminal. I did an NS lookup earlier. Well, shoot. I will do something. What basically what it's cool is Azure will uh, or Microsoft. They use a, they'll give you a custom URL, like for your instance of Azure SQL. But that custom, you, you know, that specific host name, DNS host name, basically is um, a C name to another service like Azure SQL dot Windows Online dot net. So, and that resolves to an IP address that is obviously in any cast address and Microsoft I know uses that a lot of the other cloud providers leverage anycast anycast IPv4 uh, heavily to provide resiliency for their services and to get you to the nearest um, region for example if you have multi-region services um, interesting stuff I won't go too much into that but I was fascinated by it I'm always learning stuff every day about the cloud it's really cool that's all I got, folks. Um, I'm going to do some labbing of some PIM dense mode. Sorry about the issues today with the stream. I'll try to go back and see maybe what that was related to. Uh, but thanks for stop, stopping in. Hope you all have a great night. It's Wednesday, hump day. Let's get some labbing done. Let's get some study done and get towards those certs. Thanks so much, folks. You all have a great night. Yeah, thank you, Mark Milo. Do for him. Everybody else, Big Abe, all the folks, mentors in the stream. Appreciate you all stopping by, keeping me company through this journey. We'll get there together. Y'all have a great night.